The RCMP has been under scrutiny for years regarding how it performs as community law enforcement, how it manages national policing, and even whether it's an organization capable of change. Some even wonder whether it's time to say goodbye to the Mounties as they exist now. I'm Dave Breckenridge, and this is 10-3. National Post political reporter Ryan Tumulty joins me to discuss what shortcomings have been identified within the RCMP, how that affects its ability to carry out its core mandates, and whether the federal government or top brass are committed to change. Don't forget you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon Music. I'd love it if you could leave us a rating, a review, and tell your friends about the show. So Ryan, it's been more than three years since the horrific massacre at port peak Nova Scotia that saw 22 people killed. And that case has sparked a lot of discussion in the last couple of years on the strengths and weaknesses of our national police force as, as they were the, the RCMP were the police force that responded to that incident at the time. And in the intervening couple of years, what shortcomings were identified about the, not only the RCMP response to the Porta Peak massacre, but also regarding the force as a whole. Yeah. So I would say that, you know, the, the Porta Peak massacre spurred the, the mass casualty commission, which was a really in-depth look at everything that happened that night and especially the police response. So first off, we should make clear that, you know, what they found out that was that there was no way to prevent that massacre. Um, Gabriel Wartman had killed 13 people, you know, before police even arrived on scene um, and they arrived quite quickly. Um, But what they found was that the officers who arrived were understaffed uh, there should have been more officers on that night. Uh, they were unfamiliar with the area. In fact, they had never been to that little corner of Porter Peak before, so they didn't know the community. And one of the big things that came out in terms of that response was, you know, because they didn't know the community, they didn't know that there was that kind of back road that only locals know, uh, which is where Wartman went. It's it's how he got out of sort of the neighborhood. And so they spent about six hours assuming he was still in the neighborhood and, and focusing their police response that way. And, and that was obviously a major, you know, factor because for six hours he was actually somewhere else. And, you know, he was not uh, engaged with anyone during that time. Uh, He was sitting alone in an industrial park and it was at the end of that six hours that he started killing again. It was only really when he started killing again that the RCMP realized they had made a mistake. Um, and then, of course, he went on to kill many more people. The response and and I guess the lack of knowledge of the area kind of raised raised a concern about the RCMP's role as community police officers because these officers, they get trained in Regina at Depo, and we can talk a bit about training in a little bit, and then they get sent to areas of the country that they may have very little knowledge of. And that's a big part of what the RCMP does, that community policing role. I mean, looking beyond that role, like how is the work of the RCMP divided up? What are Mounties responsible for? It's not just community policing. Yeah, absolutely. So the Mounties are the uh, police force of record, the provincial police force in eight out of 10 provinces and all of the territories. Uh, Ontario and Quebec have their own provincial police forces, but other than that, the Mounties police right across this country. Um, Then they are also responsible for what are thought of as federal crimes. Um, Things like espionage, terrorism, Um, foreign interference, which of course has been in the news a lot lately, financial crime, these sort of big federal level sort of crimes that touch the whole country are also the Mounties' responsibility. And so, you know, that is unique in terms of police forces. You know, a a Mountie may spend part of his career in rural Saskatchewan, um, you know, chasing impaired drivers and responding to break and enters, uh, but that same Mountie might end his career in Ottawa, protecting the prime minister or, you know, dealing with spies in the diplomatic community. It's 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 a huge gamut of responsibilities that is sort of unlike what a lot of other police forces around the world do. Yeah, I was I was going to ask, like, how how does the RCMP and, and how Canada approaches law enforcement compare to other countries, even compared to our neighbors to the south? Yeah, I mean, the Americans are a perfect example, right? The FBI is an entirely separate organization 
from state and local police organizations. They have their own training academy. They have their own system. And they have their own set of responsibilities. You know, um, Mounties here in Canada uh, do the same work as the FBI, but they also do the same work as those state and local agencies. And that creates a lot of demands, a lot of push and pull on their resources. After the Mass Casualty Commission, we saw a lot of discussion about, you know, how do we bring change to the RCMP? And we can talk about some of the changes that are being proposed, but it's not as though the RCMP is kind of a constantly evolving organization. It's been quite a while since we saw a major operational change in the forces mandate or the way it operates. When was that last time that we saw that kind of big sweeping change to the force? You know, I mean, I, I think someone from the RCMP might disagree with this, but I think the last time the, the RCMP went through a big structural change was in the 1980s. It was when CSIS was created uh, because the RCMP used to have those responsibilities as well. Um, so this is an organization that has always had a huge sweeping approach to the whole country um, and has had parts of that taken away from it, but they still have a huge amount. You know, they have trained at depot um, for almost the entire history of the force. Uh, they have had similar training uh, throughout that. They, they are an organization uh, with a deep and rich history, but some of that deep and rich history still seems to permeate its way into the modern force. Mm -hmm. And when you look at these competing priorities and these competing operational needs, you know, community policing, national law enforcement, national security, is the RCMP able to balance those competing needs? Are there areas where its core roles suffer because of the fact they have these competing needs? Yeah. So there was actually a, a really interesting report that came out uh, this past fall uh, from the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. Now, this is a group of MPs uh, who get full security clearance. They can read anything. They look into these kinds of big issues. And they took a look at what the RCMP is doing in that federal policing space. And what they found was that that federal policing space suffers um, because the Mounties tend to divert resources to their contracts with provinces. Uh, they know they have to meet those contracts. They have expectations and obligations there. Uh, so when they are short resources, they take them from that federal policing space. And they're still not meeting what they are being asked to do in those contract policing situations. What we found uh, through ATIPS is that the RCMP is sort of, you know, regularly running short on those contracts. They are not filling uh, the number of positions that people have asked for. So just to give a really concrete example, you know, the port of the closest attachment to Porta Peak on the night of the massacre was supposed to have six officers on duty. It only had four. The numbers that we have received show that uh, the RCMP is um, missing its targets by as much as 17% in terms of the number of officers that should be there. And when the RCMP counts vacancies, they count roles that aren't filled completely. They don't count sick leaves, disability leaves, maternity leaves, you know, the sort of things that leave a detachment short a few officers, uh, in some cases for huge chunks of time. And what impact does that have on the work the force is supposed to do? Obviously, I, as you, you know, it can affect boots on the ground. You have fewer people in, in these roles, but also when it comes to kind of the broader national work that they do, how do these issues affect that work? How does, I, I believe in the piece that you wrote, you talked about um, even intelligence that the RCMP maybe should be on top of is being fed to them by, by our allies, that our allies are even doing a better job on Canadian files than we are. Yeah. And I mean, some of that is expected. We, we are part of intelligence sharing alliances, but um, you know, a lot of the big cases that we have seen the RCMP make at a federal level over the last year start or last few years started out with tips from the FBI um, or other police agencies. You know, we know there was a case um, in London, Ontario, a gentleman who had uh, professed support for ISIS um, and he had been visited by the RCMP. He was under a peace bond at the time. Um, but when he announced online that he planned to commit a terrorist attack, um, 
it was an FBI agent who first saw that online and then alerted the RCMP who showed up at his home just as he was leaving uh, his home um, with what appeared to be a bomb. Um, You know, the case that just wrapped up this year of Cameron Ortiz, uh, an RCMP intelligence um, employee. He was not a police officer, but he was an employee who was apparently leaking secrets. You know, that case was brought to the RCMP by the FBI. Um, So there have been a few instances like that uh, where major RCMP cases get started by tips from outside the country. Um, And I think that's a major challenge. I think that's something that the, the force has to recognize with. But on some level, you know, we don't know um, what cases are being missed because they don't come to our attention. We know, you know, there are lots of concerns, for example, in uh, among the Mountie in, in British Columbia about money laundering. That would be an RCMP responsibility. We know there are concerns about foreign interference. And we've heard that we don't think that, you know, the, the foreign interference went so far as to disrupt elections. Um, But we also know that the RCMP is short staffed, so it might not be investigating some of these things as aggressively as we would like it to. We'll be right back. And when it comes to the ability to recruit, do we have an idea as to why the RCMP has these this number of vacancies and why they may be? struggling to fill these positions? Is it, re- is it a recruiting issue? Is it an image issue? What's going on there? You know, I think it is less clear exactly why the RCMP is is struggling to recruit. It, it's sort of hard to prove that negative, but they definitely are. It is also, you know, so the RCMP brings its uh, recruit classes to depot the training facility in Saskatchewan. If you sign up for that, you have to sign up for basically about six months of training at depot. That training is now paid. It previously wasn't, uh, but it is now paid at a, at a very low rate. Um, and then you have to be on board with the idea that the RCMP may send you anywhere in the country that they so choose. You know, you can be a recruit who comes to the force from Atlantic Canada and be posted in British Columbia. Uh, you know, the RCMP is starting to make small changes to that, but. That is part of life as a Mountie, is that you can be shipped anywhere that the Mounties feel you will best serve the, their, their needs. Um, and so it's a big commitment. Lots of police forces are struggling with recruiting right now. And so I think for the RCMP, one of the challenges is, you know, if you grew up in the Edmonton area, you can join the EPS or you can join the Calgary Police Force if you you don't have to make that decision to go with the RCMP. Um, Their latest financial numbers. So they put, they tried to put through 40 recruit classes uh, every year. Last year, they managed to do 28. So they are continuing to miss that recruiting target. And that's going to add up. That's going to have an impact on the force. Mm -hmm. And and you look at the training in general, as you say, it's six months at depot. And they, I assume that, a lot of the focus is on the community policing role, which potentially leaves the RCMP lacking in new recruits who have skills in these other areas. Is that the case? Are, you know, are they focusing on more, more on one area than another? And, and how does that affect their ability to bring people up in the ranks to potentially work at national headquarters? Yeah, so this is one of the things that came out of that uh, review from the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians uh, was that, you know, Recruits at depot get maybe a few hours of training that is related to the federal policing program. And so their, their focus is on that contract policing program. They spend, you know, they spend more time on uh, drill and deportment, which is essentially marching, uh, than they do on federal policing. And it's a big concern. Um, you know, the, the National Intelligence Committee says that, you know, they're not bringing in people with those specialized skills. Um, because people don't necessarily want to, if if people are interested in, uh, you know, going after financial crimes, for example, they don't necessarily want to spend years in rural Saskatchewan, um, you know, dealing with break and enters and, you know, drunk driving offenses. So there was a, there is a push on to create a new federal police training program. And the, the force says it is moving in that direction, but I think it is a big concern. 
Now, is it just a matter of training? Are there other solutions that people are pitching? Is it just a, about, you know, how it approaches bringing in new recruits? Is it training or, or is it about even, you know, the, the nuclear option, I guess, in this case, breaking up the RCMP so they're not dealing with those competing priorities? Yeah, I think there are a lot of people who are suggesting that it is past time that we look at breaking up the RCMP. You know, the contract policing partners we've seen in Alberta and certainly Nova Scotia is is, is considering change. Um, we've seen communities in BC and Alberta walk away from the RCMP because they feel like it's not missing, meeting their needs. Um, so there is a lot of talk about whether or not it doesn't make sense for, for the force to finally be you know, fully broken apart um, so that it is doing different things. I know this is an active conversation inside the federal government. The, the Mass Casualty Commission was not the first sort of big report to, to call for big structural change. Uh, we have seen that a few times now in different issues around the RCMP. Different reports on the RCMP have called for that big structural change. It is, you know, it is a different policing structure than we see in a lot of places in the world. And, you know, everything they cover, having that sort of one size fits all approach, maybe doesn't work as much now as it did when the RCMP was formed 150 years ago. And as, as you mentioned, there, there are talks about the, kind of the contract policing role, the community policing role in, in a number of provinces. But as I understand it, all of those contracts are up for renewal in less than 10 years. Could we see those contracts go unrenewed? Could we see more provinces step up and say, we want to look at going our own way? Yeah. I, you know, I know the federal government is looking at those contracts and looking at what the stakes would be, how the structure would be of a renewal. And I think in the year or two ahead, they're going to be presenting what a renewed contract. Now, the contracts don't renew until the mid-2030s. But if you're talking about, you know, creating a new police force in a province or something like that, you do need years and years of time. Grand Prairie, Alberta, for example, which is moving away from the RCMP, has a five-year plan to do so. And obviously that's on a much smaller scale. So I, I think the, you know, the federal government is taking a hard look at this thing. Um, they are looking at significant changes. They are looking at new ways to do things. And I think they're going to be presenting something to the provinces and the provinces may decide at that moment that this new version of the RCMP is not for them. And just even in response to the, the, the piece that you wrote, what did the federal government or the RCMP have to say about, you know, making changes or addressing challenges that have been raised in, in recent years? How are they responding to this? You know, I, they have committed to sort of transparently um, responding to the Mass Casualty Commission. Um, we haven't seen a lot of that yet. Now, the Mass Casualty Commission's report is not that old. It's, it's coming up on a year old, but they haven't made that many changes yet. But they do recognize that there is a need for serious and systemic change. I'm not hearing a lot uh, from the RCMP itself about ending their provincial police contracts or something like that. There is talk about a new federal training program. Uh, there is, you know, a more aggressive recruitment drive going on all the time. They are talking about changing some of the rules so that a recruit from British Columbia, for example, could go back to British Columbia after going to the training academy. Certainly, they're always looking at ways to change. But, you know, the RCMP believes that some of what it of its size is part of its strength. So when there is a need for uh, a big group of police to be brought to bear for, for a G7 summit or an Olympics or something like that. That is a that is a a skill that the RCMP can bring to bear that is harder for uh, another police force to do, and it would be a bigger challenge. We certainly saw the RCMP brought a lot of officers uh, during the convoy protests here in Ottawa. There are elements of the RCMP size that play to specific strengths. I think the question is going to be: Do those offset the other problems that we see day to day across this country? Hmm. Well, I know it's something that, that the federal government and the RCMP will have to reckon with in the, in the coming years, and we'll see how that all unfolds. Ryan, thanks for your time. You're welcome. Ten Three is produced by Sean Knox, theme music by Bryce Hall. Thanks to my guest, Ryan Tumulty. More from him at nationalpost.com. I'm Dave Breckenridge. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.